content presented in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice, and listeners are encouraged to consult with qualified financial professionals before making any investment decisions. The views expressed on the show are that of the guests and the host and may not be the same views of LaSalle Street Securities or LaSalle Street Investment Advisors. Welcome to Investing with Integrity, the podcast dedicated to BRI, Biblically Responsible Investing. In each episode, we delve into the world of BRI, where we prioritize values over just financial gains. We believe true wealth encompasses the well-being of individuals, communities, and the world. Join us as we chat with industry experts, advisors, pastors, and more, sharing insights into BRI's core principles. We'll explore how companies are evaluated for ethical inclusion, ethical industries, and the impact of shareholder activism. Of course, BRI has its challenges and will openly address them, offering tips on how to navigate these challenges while staying true to your values. Our goal is to empower you with resources to make informed, value-aligned investment decisions. If you want a portfolio that aligns your financial and moral goals, Investing with Integrity is your podcast. Let's discover how wisdom, principles, morals, and integrity can shape a purposeful approach to investing. Join us in exploring how faith-based values and finance can coexist harmoniously. So get ready for this transformative journey where we prioritize wisdom over worth, principles over profit, morals over money, and integrity over it all. With Integrity Podcast, my name is Jeff Tellerico. I am your host. Today, we have Lauren Graham with us. And Lauren is a published author, CKA, CPA, and CFP, and has operated his own independent professional practice specializing in faith-based investing for over a decade. In past years, Lauren has been an invited guest speaker at the Kingdom Advisors National Conference, helping other advisors embrace faith-based investing. More recently, Lauren was a contributing teacher for the Faith Driven Investing core curriculum video training now available to KA members. Lauren was also recognized by LPL Financial as a leader in the movement of faith-based investing. Having served as a founding chair for the advisor-led LPL Kingdom Advisors Large Firm Community Group from 2016 to 2018. Lauren's book, Investing with Integrity, How Investment Choices Can Be an Act of Worship, is currently in its second printing and has received endorsements from Randy Elkhorn, Ron Blue, and Howard Dayton, just to name a few. Lauren has also been active in his local community, having served on many nonprofit boards over the years. Lauren lives in Spokane, Washington, with his wife, Ashley, three teenagers, one preteen, and their three cats. Lauren and Ashley are newly married in 2023 and are grateful for new beginnings. Now, in his free time, which with three teenagers, I don't know how he has any, He enjoys the great outdoors and flying as a licensed private pilot. Lauren, welcome to the show. We're glad you're here with us today. Thanks, Jeff. It's an honor to be here and uh, just hearing you read that bio. It's it's humbling uh, just to think how God has used me in just a small way, hopefully, for this movement of faith-based investing. But it's it's a privilege uh, to be a guest on your show, and thanks for having me. No problem at all, Lauren. I'm glad you were finally able to get some time in your schedule to be part of what we're doing because it's all advancing the kingdom of God. So let's start off. I'm going to ask you something that is interesting about yourself that most people might not know. Sure. Well, uh, the last part of your introduction, a lot of people don't know that I'm uh, a licensed private pilot. So it's something that uh, has been a lifelong dream. Uh, I have memories uh, flying with my dad as a little kid. And, uh, so I kind of got the bug from, from my dad and had some, um, uh, kind of a special, uh, sentimental value for me wanting to do that, but it was an accomplishment. I was able to earn my ticket as a pilot uh, a couple of years ago and, um, kind of a highlight kind of wrapped up in, in that, uh, pastime. Um, for first dad, uh, he passed away last summer. Um, from cancer, but uh, about a month and a half before he passed, uh, we're able to arrange a special flight with him so that I could take my dad out, and um, and that was that was really meaningful to me to be able to do that. Uh, that's cool. That's something that you'll remember forever, and that's a it's a beautiful thing to have done something with your dad like that that you grew up doing with him. So that's something that 
You'll remember that forever, Lauren. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So you and I actually first met at a, I believe it was Guidestone event in Dallas, Texas, probably seven, eight years ago, maybe. Yeah. And it's been, it's been really cool to, you know, now have you on the show, but to see you at the Kingdom Advisor conferences over the years, to have, to have gotten your book, to have read your book, to understand what this faith-based investment movement really is all about. Coming from another advisor, more so than uh, one of the houses that we do business with, you know, Timothy Plan, Eventide, those kind of things. So sure. having another advisor on the show is going to be really good for us because it's going to give a different perspective. So tell us, you know, how did you get started in the financial services industry to begin with? Yeah, sort of by accident. I was, you know, originally my career was on a an accounting pathway uh, as a CPA and working with a large public auditor firm, uh, accounting firm. And one of our one of my uh, audit clients was a, a institutional investment house in in the Los Angeles area, and uh, honored to get an invitation to kind of become their controller. They needed some in house accounting help and. You know, I was working with the CFO and doing doing my the, the accounting for him and everything. But then all the excitement, and all the fun was happening in the in the securities. You know, the the stock picker uh, stock picking and the everything. And you know, that was where all the fun was. So I I um, you know was able to get get my securities licensing. And then when I moved to the Pacific Northwest, you know, uh, was really praying, asking God, you know, how how can I use this institutional knowledge that I have? There aren't a lot of Big institutional firms in, in uh, you know, Spokane, Washington, but um, but I really felt that calling me to see how I could help individuals with families, you know, and take that skill set. So that 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 was my my big leap into launching a, a financial planning practice. Um, and so essentially, you know, starting from zero and and just you know trusting that would uh, lead me along the way. So that was uh, just over sixteen years ago. Um, that I began that journey as a financial planner, and um, and it's been neat to see, you know, <laughs> just reflecting back on all that, you know, the the lessons learned, and you know, we all, you know, <laughs> you know, make some wrong turns, you know, along the way, but just how uh, and God's graciousness, you know, here here we are, and um, just so it's such an honor to you know get to know these families and and be a voice in their lives and, and just watch them go through milestones. And, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad. You know, we just had you know, two clients that are where they have um, adult children that are um, facing terminally ill uh, terminal illnesses. And it's uh, to be able just to, to pray together, cry together. It's just been, um, you know, I just, you know, I thank God for that privilege to be just in that role. So. That's some of the greatest joy that I think we all can experience as a financial advisor when we can actually be there for our clients, when we can hug their necks, when we can actually, like you said, cry with them. You know, I've had, I have really great relationships with my clients and I, there's no doubt in my mind that you do, you do as well. And it's, it's being able to be that voice and that friend in trying to help explain what happens. I mean, God is still sovereign. He's still God. And and his plan does is something we don't know or understand fully. And when when something like an adult child having a terminal illness happens, being there for them and being their pillar is is just something that that we get to we have the privilege to do. So yeah. I, I commend you for that too, Lauren. And and realizing that is part of what we do. It's not about money, right? It's not. It's yeah, it, uh, I was just actually just this this Sunday um, at church. The, this room was on expectations and and on you know at Palm Sunday you know uh, yesterday and and so um, you know how how have the the Israelites' expectations of Christ were as he was entering the city you know I think they didn't they didn't really see that coming I think it was John sixteen where the scripture that talks about um, Jesus said you know in this world there will be uh, trials and sorrows and um, and so, and, and we face that, you know, in the markets about every, you know, eight or nine years, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, just be able to, to just, to be there and try to speak, seek timeless wisdom. It's been, um, it's been a, a neat journey. And it, it was only about a, a really a, a year, not even a year into my professional practice. Um, and I was, you know, following the certified financial planning principles and everything, but, um, it was just within the first really six months of the practice that I discovered 
Kingdom Advisors and that there was a link on how to integrate faith with advice. And um, that was a game changer for me. So you've been basically in this faith-driven movement, this biblically responsible investing type movement for most of your career then. Uh, June 2009 uh, was when I, you know, that's how they called the, you know, a qualified kingdom advisor, now a certified kingdom advisor. But I went to the, it was the last KA conference uh, in, that they hosted in Atlanta in that um, uh, 2009 time frame. I think there were like 300 people at the conference. You know, I just got back from Florida where they were, I saw you there, you know, it, but you were, we were among like 3,000 people there, you know, and, and it's just how it's grown is fantastic but um but they're relating to some of the investment houses that uh we rely upon you know to implement faith-based investing you know they had uh booths at that conference and um it's the first time i'd ever uh heard of the idea that you could uh even and not only follow biblical financial planning principles but also invest in a way that reflects faith and and um and values and so it was a complete paradigm shift. And I remember calling my, my best friend at the time. Um, he was running his own hedge fund in New York. Um, but we were high school and college friends at UCLA. And he, uh, I remember calling him and I said, you know, David, uh, I just, I just found my life passion. Like, this is it. This is what I, I need to be doing. And it's been, um, it's been a neat, you know, journey from there. But that was, uh, yeah, uh, a little while ago. Pretty, pretty amazing story there. Now, you know, in your book, you start out right from the beginning in chapter one, talking about this three-story house. Can you explain that so our listeners, you know, I want them to go get your book, of course, but at least give them some a teaser of to what that means and, and how that uh, is implemented in, in your practice. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I, I always, you know, um, and, you know, having kind of a reformed theology background, you know, understanding that everything we do is sacred. Uh, in life, you know, everything that we do is an act of worship, um, and uh, and how and, and trying to understand how investing fits into the the framework of our everyday uh, faith driven activities, or how we live, how we how we use money, and how we give money, and how we invest money, and and so I was trying to come up with something you know clever and you know that that would make a good analogy and. Uh, I just remember thinking, okay, Christ is the foundation of everything. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, foundations are, you know, what you put a house on. <laughs> so I was like, wait, and I kind of went from there. But I, um, the idea is, though, is that, uh, you know, the first level of the house is our relationships, the greatest commandment, you know, to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so that, um, and it doesn't, you know, God doesn't call us to judge our neighbor to, to measure our neighbor, but to love, you know, how do we love our neighbor? And that's, relationship and that's um you know in um every area of life you know christ modeled that for us you know the disciples what you know the greatest love is this that you lay down your life for your friends you know forgiveness and all that and so uh so we do the best we can to love our neighbor forgive our neighbor um imperfectly because we're human and we're fallen and we're gonna sin and we're gonna have to ask for the innocent. <laughs> and it's uh you know that's that's uh but it's the like great the great thing about that foundation of Christ is that he did that work on the cross and it's appropriate that next, this coming Sunday is, is we celebrate the, that, the resurrection Sunday, that, that that work that he accomplished on the cross, um, covers, um, you know, our past, present and future sins that the work is done. There's nothing we can do to, um, earn God's favor anymore because he loves us already um and that and that because of christ we can have a reconciliation relationship with with the, with our fathers so uh, that's an important acknowledgement that it's imperfect that you know we're, we're doing the best we can the lord is with us um and is walking with us and he'll pick us up when we fall down you know and that's um but to love our neighbor and as ourselves that's the, kind of the first story um and then the second story was okay because of what Christ has done on the cross and, and because we have accepted him um, and are in relationship with him, how do we handle money differently in light of that? You know, of course. So it, it, the second story of the house was our outflow. How 
how we give money, how we spend money, um, the types of businesses we choose to, you know, patronize believers and based on what they stand for and different things. So that's all the the second story of the house. And then, um, but there's this, and that's where most people live. Like a lot of the um, uh, biblical financial stewardship, uh, educational materials and books out there are all kind of in this in this area. You know, how how do you you know budget and ask your tithing and giving and spending and all that. So that's um and that's where all the you know we, we've all read you know a lot of materials in that area um but uh the third story of the house is almost like kind of this attic this like this extra story that was kind of discovered that it's like hey wait what about how we earn money and invest money you know if we're if we're being you know uh and, and again the, the spending isn't perfect you know like uh everybody's gonna blow the budget <laughs> once in a while and oh what do I, you know lord forgive me how do I, am i big out of this you know and, or, um, but you know, we're faithful to tithe. We're faithful to try to you know live responsibly as good stewards, you know, within our means, spending less than we earn, as as Ram Blue would say. Um, then that's that's an expression of worship. Um, it's it's not to earn God's favor or a gold star, but it's 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 an expression of worship, you know, because and so that the third story of the house is is about how we earn money, and that's where the investments come in. Um, but just like relationships and spending is going to be an imperfect process, you know, investing is, it's the heart behind it that's important and God sees our heart and he, and, and that's, that's, what's important. So in earnest, you know, if we're trying to honor him in every area of life, you know, going back to that, um, everything is sacred, um, then, um, that, that kind of completes the construction, if you will. <laughs> well, uh, I, I like the the word that you chose to reference all three of these stories. You called it stewarding, stewarding relationships, stewarding resources, stewarding how we earn money. Sure. Because stewarding is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. How do we steward these treasures that God has allowed us to have here? And, and, and it's a great part of the Christian journey and the Christian story. You know, one of the one of the things you mentioned is it's the heart behind it. So this is where a lot of times in in the BRI space in the faith based space we have seen we have seen brothers in arms battle on what is what's the heart say what does God really say about this? So we have some screens that are just negative screens screens everything in the world out, and then we have some that only screen out certain things. So. You talk about this in your book, in um, what was the chapter called? Uh, Defining what is good. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. And you know, you you gave a pretty good idea of the screening process that you guys use, and I'm assuming you're still using that. So, how do, how does that look for you? How do you play that off um, when you have a client that says, "No, I really, really, really want to own this stock or this company." Yeah. So um, we, I, I actually, I really appreciate. Uh, how you know, the different investment you know managers have their own unique screening process, and and uh, some companies you know put more emphasis on some screens than others. One one uh, fun family that comes to mind is just really lasered in on the the abortion screen and sanctity of life screen that they they will not own any companies that. Um, of course, manufacture the abortion patients, um, but also really dig deep on the Planned Parenthood donations and and try to avoid companies that are um, you know using corporate shareholder dollars for um, those nonprofit donations that really are you know pretty controversial, and and that's <laughs> that's at best. <laughs> but uh, so so some funds are really great at that. Other others are really great at. Um, the you know the impact screens on how to um, how to not just avoid companies but actually leverage and lean into these companies and get enough capital behind them that they actually can uh, earn the right to sit down across the table from the CEO or from the board and say hey these are the concerns that we have you have a great product you have a great company. You know why are you donating to Planned Parenthood? Can we please stop that? You know, and and they listen. You know, they'll listen, and so they've they've had great success with that. So there's there's two totally different approaches. You know, one is you know avoidance, the negative screen. The other is a um, kind of a positive affecting change. You know, strategy. Um, and then I like kind of the the third component, which is not just the company's product or service, but it's their relationship in the ecosystem that they live. You know, so it's 
um, looking at, okay, are these companies also dealing ethically with their um, employees, their customers, their supply chains? Um, are they stewarding the environment, you know, in a way that's not leaving, you know, a wake of destruction, you know, in their path and they're actually, um, steward, you know, uh, stewarding their resources um, in ways that are reflecting the local values also. So I, I love, so all these different companies together, you know, if, you know, if I was really taking it, you know, this is more important, instead of weighing one over the other, I just kind of take them all together and say, this is sort of the mosaic the 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 stained glass window mosaic you know that that represents the church you know and and different ways of doing things but in the end um it's the the heart of it is all good that it's all trying to honor god with how they approach investing and and so we're um uncomfortable with those differences good that's uh you know i think we're we're a lot on the same page with this we we know these companies we've dealt with these companies we've you know, broke bread with these companies and, and understanding why their money managers do what they do and how they do it is easy for us to then turn around and explain to clients. So let's uh, let's change gears for a second here and let's talk about performance because that seems to always be one that our guests like to talk about. So how do these proponents of biblically responsible investing or faith-based faith investing uh, reconcile the tension sometimes that happens between a, a client's misunderstanding, if you will, of performance when they when they break down a fund into something so specific, yeah. So so performance is uh, you know it's part of good stewardship. We wanna we wanna aim for the best returns we can. Uh, you know for each client's level of risk tolerance and needs and objectives, and um, but at the same time uh, do so in a way that that's honoring God and, and part of our act of worship, our act of worship. So it's a so it's definitely important. We can't just ignore performance. You know, I, I do, and you know, our clients, uh, they don't ignore it either. So we have to, <laughs> oh, so I, uh, I, what I found is, and I actually, I still, you know, I hold this philosophy, um, and, and it started from actually Sir John Templeton, um, who originally, um, I think formed this thought that, uh, and there's a lot of logic to it. It makes a lot of sense that if a good, if a company has a great product or service, and they're um they're meeting a real need in the world and they're doing it well with integrity and ethics um they're treating their employees ethically their their customers ethically and um you know doing things the right way for the right reason that ultimately those companies um will be more profitable than companies that are just narrow minded on on you know uh, short-term profits and cutting corners to try to make numbers look better and everything. So, so I, I do believe that philosophy that the, the adding these faith-based uh, considerations actually enhances the potential for return rather than being a a source of drag. You know that it's holding it back. I actually believe that the book flows would be better long-term because of because of the focus. Um, that being said, you know when we're when we're uh, tied to you know, passive benchmarks, there's going to be this yin and yang, you know, where sometimes, you know, the faith based portfolios look better and sometimes, you know, the secular benchmarks can look better. And, uh, but the key is, you know, over the long term, you know, over the five year, 10 year, 20 year averages, and it's exciting that we actually are uh, not that far away from having 20 year averages in the space. I'm confident that, that, you know, a lot of the differences just kind of smooth out over time, but, um, and a lot of, a lot of focus this last, you know, quarter on the Magnificent Seven and how tech is just, you know, pulling the whole market. And so just reminding clients that, yeah, we're, we're going to be diversified and, you know, the understanding how the S&P is built and how just a few handful of companies can be almost a third of the entire performance, you know, that's, um, you know, not always going to be the case, but that's just the weird place that the market is right now. So I'm having... To have a few conversations to help people understand, you know, if they're not in some of those big tech names because of the faith screens, um, that may look unaffected now, but, you know, um, over time, you know, the market tends to get ahead of itself and overexcited about things. So it everything kind of comes back into, <laughs> everything eventually comes back into balance. So right now, the you know, it's a little, a lot of balance, but, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing that, 
we we both deal with some high net worth clients and they don't even understand sometimes what is in the Dow Jones. They don't realize it's only 30 stocks. And here we are living and breathing and dying in by what the Dow does on a daily basis. You know, the stock market drops 600 points and all of a sudden everyone thinks that that it, the world's crashing down and it's not. It's 30 stocks. It's not representative of everything. So it's it's interesting that you said that about the S&P and I'm glad you did because it is so unbalanced from what it really started as being. Oh, well, we have these benchmarks, you know, because you, know, you have to measure something, but I think it really plays on um, that that FOMO, you know, fear of missing out mentality. And so uh, I, I find it's helpful to kind of try to refocus the client's uh, perspective retention on not, not just comparing, because, um, you know, I will have some things to say about that, so it's not good to compare that. Um, to other, but we, but uh, just to focus on, okay, this is what the Lord's entrusted to you. Why are we investing in the first place? It's because you're trying to steward what He's entrusted to you, accomplish family goals, e use money as a tool for God given purposes, to um, teach, educate, and prepare the next generation for stewardship. And, and really trying to ask the question, okay, are, um, this is the path that we're on, and we can earn a respectable return for their risk for uh, without taking too much risk and accomplish all these goals and they can't spend it all during their lifetime and they can't take it with them so in the end it's going to go on to the next generation or to hopefully you know fund kingdom causes and and just kind of point them back to what's the purpose of all this in the first place it's not a, it's not a horse race it's 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 a finish line, you know. That brings us to Ron Blue's famous quote, how much is enough and what are you going to do with the rest? Great. That's right. So, so let's, let's talk about you. You own your company. You, you've been in business now for almost two decades at this point, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, we're in our 17th year. So, so uh, how, how is it that you get to bring your faith to work every day and you find joy and satisfaction in that? And tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I do. I, I remember um, I, early on, actually, just um, right after I basically committed to moving down the road of, of faith-based investing and, and rebranding and really just putting a stake in the ground, this is what we're all about. Um, I remember uh, getting a call out of the blue um, invitation to lunch, and it was uh, with a big warehouse. And um and a friend that I'd gotten to know and a mentor uh, in some ways and had offered me a, um, to be a, basically like a junior partner in a, in a billion dollar practice. But, uh, these were most institutional clients and, um, you're going to have to not spend, you know, time in the biblically responsible investing area. That's, you have to step away from that. Um, because that's not what this is, uh, this practice is about. Um, and and I almost felt like I was like being invited to non top and you know this all could be yours at the end if you just walk away and um and I just I prayed about it I wrestled with it because at the time I was you know just struggling to get practice off the ground and and uh, you know racing being this diet and just trying to you know balance the books you know and I really prayed I said no this is I remember, and my friend that I had called you know he's also my kind of belief partner still is um, we have all every two weeks just to pray together and check in but um he reminded me of that excited call i i that i called him from the cave conference on the way to the airport he said this is he said this is your passion you're calling what do you think god would want you to do and I'm like, oh. so then i i uh i just kept moving forward and trusting god with with the result and the, and he's been faithful to like you know uh, allow us to come this far so um and I'm still uh, good friends with that advisor, and then I think they're at two or three billion now, and that's okay. But um, but it's uh, it's been neat to see this this journey that God had me on. Uh, so I, I trust him completely. Every time I I see that you know there's a tough market or you know a global pandemic, for example, or things that you know we've you know all the rough patches in, in my life, I've, I've seen evidence of, of God's presence, and um, He's definitely at work in the world and in his kingdom. So it's, it's, a, it's humbling to just that he allows us to be a part of it. So let, let's change gears here first. Why do you think other CKA members, other uh, kingdom advisor members, 
other advisors like us that that have a hard time truly embracing BRI or faith based investments? Um, I think it's um, maybe a little bit of a fear of the unknown. I mean, I try to reflect back on what what was what was um, holding me back and. You know, and it was the advice I got at the time that, you know, from several people that, well, there's not a large enough market to have a, a practice that it's entirely dedicated to just faith based that you have to be broader and appeal to more people. And, um, and that, you know, there's not enough, um, demand, you know, to, to be sustainable. I, I, you know, was in my faith journey, I just kind of, you know, decided to commit the practice to faith based and burn the ships behind me because I knew myself. I knew I might second guess myself or like, wait a minute, is this the right thing? So I said, nope, we're going all in. And, uh, but it, there is so much demand. Uh, the need is, is, is great. And, and the, you know, the workers are few because at the end of the day, uh, one financial advisor really only has capacity maybe to serve, you know, 200 households. I think the, the real number of the, Research, you know, says more like 150. I think is the is the number. Uh, how our, our Nikon created our minds and our capacity for relationship is, you know, similar research for how many you know people can pastor, um, shepherd, you know, and um, still remember everybody's names. And that. <laughs> um, but I think so. You know, I'm pretty certain there's at least 150 to 200 people out there that that can't find a a faith-based adv advisor that, and they would love to be for that. And so I, I found that the, the, um, that, 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 um, that fear of, of not being able to be successful or that the practice is going to wither and die, or, um, is I think, you know, largely from the enemy that he doesn't want us to uh, take a, you know, take a step forward because, um, it can have real impact in, the economy in the world, you know, like another favorite quote of Ron Blues, I like to say is, you know, if he, he used to say all the time, you know, if you change Wall Street, you change the world. I really believe that. Um, and so it's, and it's, it's actually kind of started to happen. It was really neat. So yeah. Yeah. Mark Manella, I don't know if you know, Mark with faith investor services, he is starting this new campaign and it's called rescue one T he wants to start and just get, just get $1 trillion out of the secular side of Wall Street and into the faith-based side of Wall Street. And I wow. think that's a great initiative to start there. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I, we're probably not that far from accomplishing that, I would uh, trust. But it's, um, so yeah, I think fear is, you know, is part of it. Uh, but, uh, and then just, you know, having to learn, you know, a new way of doing things, you know, for especially advisors that are on the kind of the, the sunset side of their career and getting ready to pass the torch. Um, but uh, I see a, a lot of excitement with the younger um, generation of, of advisors that um, just want to start that way from the get go. And so I, I think, I think um, there's a tremendous opportunity. And, you know, I always said that if, if it, you know, clients, they come to us because they trust us, they trust us for advice, but also, you know, there's that trust relationship. And so, you know, if we if we come to a client really excited about something and say, "Hey, I think this is really important," and um, you know, are you willing to trust me on this and and, follow, and come with me on this? And um, I think um, you know they're gonna pick up on on that excitement and energy. And if we come to the client and say, "You know, I'm really nervous about this, but I've been thinking a lot about this, and I'm not sure which way to go, but..." What do you think? You know, and they're, they're going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if you don't, um, if you don't like it or you're not excited about it, I'm not going to be excited about it. Right, and so it's. I think it's just having that that um, conviction and and confidence, and then just trusting the Lord. I think advisors would find a lot a lot more success in this conversation than 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 you know they might might think. So. Well, I, I think you hit you hit the nail on the head. I mean it. We have this younger generation coming out that is phenomenal, and and it, and it all starts in the college campuses. I mean, you you were just at Kingdom Advisors. We had almost 300 college kids there that Amazing. are at various institutions throughout this country learning the Kingdom Advisor approach to investing, and that's phenomenal. Liberty University is doing a great job, and there's many, many more out there that are doing it as well. So 
let's let's uh let's look at your crystal ball for a second. Where do you think the market's heading in the next five to ten, fifteen years? <laughs> um well, well I, I threw my crystal ball away a long time ago, but I think people are trying to fish it out of the waste can and you know, uh I I don't know where it's gonna go, but um but you know, if this tree is any guide, um I was actually just uh, looking at this the other day with the client, um, but in April of 2020, and that was, so this was before the recovery, um, right in the middle of the pandemic, you know, the, the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones were both down close to 50%. Um, and um, and everybody was, you know, it was just a very unique time in history, but I, uh, I did this webinar with um, uh, Eventide, um, and, and Jason presented, um, but he, and this is actually, um, I need to give credit to Jason and even type for this analogy, but I, I love this, this analogy. Um, there's a, a graph that was put up on the screen. It was 150 years of, of stock data, uh, history going back from 1870 to 2020. And you can see, you know, the line going, you know, back and forth, back and forth, but, um, you know, slowly progressing upward. And then there was this yellow line that went right through it, and it was a it wasn't like a scatter plot graph. It was almost a it was a it was a almost a not perfect, but a very strong correlation that this was a very clear average. And that data was um, showing that the the market has over that period of time averaged about six and a half percent real return. So a uh, return minus inflation, which kind of jives with what we always expect you know the s p is you know somewhere in that nine to ten percent average annual range and inflation in the three to three and a half percent range um but that was the history 150 years and and you kind of the zigzags that were kind of around the average line um uh, jason kind of painted this picture of you know imagine somebody walking their dog through central park new york and they're they're on um a, pa a sidewalk path that's taking them across the park to their favorite coffee shop on the other end um but they're walking their dog and the dog's on a long leash and so the dog is like sniffing the flowers and running circles and zigzagging and you know all over the place but the owner just got that leash and he's on his way to the coffee shop and he like in the the stock park is kind of like the dog you know like all over the place you know but the but the average is like the owner you know walking the dog and so the the coined phrase was you know keep your eye on the owner uh, keep your eye on the owner, not the dog. You know, keep, keep your eye on the owner. But I love the kind of the, the, the double meaning there. You know, keep your eye on the owner because ultimately, you know, God owns it all, and these are His money, is His investments. And so, if we keep our eye on the owner, we're gonna make much better decisions. You know, uh, less anxiety. And so, you know, that, that <laughs> what is it that you know this phrase by heart? You know, uh, the compliance phrase, you know, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Yeah, but love that. 150 years is a long time. And think about everything that's happened in that time. You know, it's post-Civil War reconstruction, World War One, World War Two, a Great Depression in there, um, every kind of possible calamity you can think of. And yet, you know, the free market uh, capital system, it, you know, keeps marching forward. It's adaptable, you know, it survives. And, and changes and grows to to, uh, to adapt to its environment. So, um, so I, I can't give you that um, crystal ball number. I I I have a lot of confidence in the free market system, and if we make decisions within that system, guided by faith, um, I think I think and follow you know wisdom principles. I think um, God will honor that. Absolutely. Well, I've had Jason on the show, so I, I'm very familiar with him. I love him. I, in fact, I think I, I offered that same webinar to our clients as well, and it was great. <laughs> yeah. Great show. So, all right, let's get down to the last couple of questions here. If there, were, if there were three people, dead or alive, that you could have a conversation with, who would they be and why? And you can't say Jesus. Can't say Jesus. Uh, interesting. Well, um, yeah, so three people. I think uh, if I could have a conversation with, well, one would be, um, Ulysses uh, S. Grant, I think, um, the former Beatles president and general. Um, I would say him because I, I was really fascinated reading his um, biography um, by uh, uh, 
Oh, I think it's uh, Isaac Walterson. Is all that? I think he's the same. He wrote the biography for Steve Jobs, and but um, it was. Uh, I remember I handed my book, my book, you know, to a client to read. Hey, I thought you know you'd like to read this. And so when I met him for coffee the next time, he brought that book. And if you've seen the book, it's like a thousand pages. But so he was giving me back. But <laughs> it's but it's like but I, it was just a fascinating journey. Uh, you know his leadership and navigating you know um civil war issues and um he's very very much ahead of his time um and was a proponent of actually civil rights in his day in the 1800s that uh unfortunately we didn't see come to fruition until the you know Martin Luther King Jr. years and and then um you know somewhere even even now we're just kind of getting to where it was supposed to be but um but I, I love I love this his life story I would love to sit down with him for a little bit uh, abraham lincoln is like also before in <laughs> same area i guess but uh again just on leadership and faith and when everyone's against you you know how do you rise above all that and um in the short amount of time he was with us um or he, uh, on this earth i should say um third person uh, gosh, uh, uh, maybe Martin Luther, actually. Another, um, you know, all these um, leaders that, that changed the the whole um, mindset, you know, or, or it changed the direction of the of humanity, I guess. But um, uh, that's a uh, that would be really neat to to learn from him, I guess. So <laughs> those are those are three great people. I I admire you for those. Though I mean. Two definitely changed the course of our country, and then, of course, Martin Luther changed the course of humanity as we know it today, I believe. So those are great. All right, so the last question. What didn't I ask you that you're just dying to talk about? Well, let's see. We've we've covered uh, uh, covered a lot. I think, uh, you know, one thing that we didn't uh, didn't touch on, um, but I think is important, and it's kind of the the underpinning of faith-based investing, and that is, you know, investing has evolved so much. There are all these new ways to invest. Um, you know, it used to be that you just invest in individual companies. Like, uh, I won't mention the names, I guess, but, you know, like if, if you invested in a certain soda pop, you know, yeah, everybody, you know, the Coke versus Pepsi, you know, <laughs> taste test, right? But, you know, you, you, you'd have this, like, connection with the company or, um, the product, if you use the product a lot, and oh, I, I, I really like that that product. Um, but as investing has become, in some ways, more sophisticated and complex, um, we've lost that connection with the individual companies and the products. So whether it's you know, through mutual funds or ETFs or um, these um, just passive indices where you just own the whole market, you know, and um, it's been uh, and or or the technical analysis where it's investing is just charts and lines and graphs and trends and it doesn't matter what the companies are anymore i think um that disconnect um has allowed companies to kind of get away with you know um a lot of bad behavior and uh and so i think that uh um, my hope is that you know as faith-based investing really continues to grow and take off that 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 connection between the investor and the the actual corporation um, becomes uh, stronger and more transparent that we, we come back to understand what is investing, you know, when you boil it down, it's investing in a company that makes real goods and real services that are trying to, you know, um, improve humanity in some way or you know, contribute to human flourishing is, you know, how one company says it, which I love. Um, and, uh, I think that'll go a long way for um, companies being more responsible. They're not citizens, but being um, responsible participants in community. They, uh, they'd be stewards. Yeah. Simple as that. So where can people get your book? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's on uh, Amazon. It's also uh, the publisher, uh, Kingdom Life Publishing. So if you just you know, search Kingdom Life, uh, Kingdom Life Publishing has, um, bulk order discounts too it's it's meant to be an educational book to directly to investors and the call to action in the book is you know to to um to to pray about it talk to your pastor if you're not sure and 
talk to your financial advisor. So really it supports existing relationships. Um, you know, it's not a under call us do whatever, you know, marketing. It's just so other other there are actually quite a few advisors that use it in their practices um to help educate their clients and it's not you know competitive with us even though we have we have a practice in the northwest but um uh, so so i encourage uh yeah folks with clients are just wanting to understand it better it's a great tool to you know to light read it's not technical so hopefully you know it'll uh make a dent in the universe uh that oh. way for our listeners, I will put those links in the show notes so you can go directly to Amazon or to his publishing company and take a look at those books there. Lauren, thank you again for your time. I know that it's pressing and, and I really appreciate it. And I'm honored that you chose to be on our show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me and, uh, and blessings to you. All right. God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. You've been listening to the Investing with Integrity podcast with your host, Jeff Tellerico. Tune in on the first and third Wednesdays of every month to hear from other advisors, industry experts, pastors, and more as we discuss biblical thoughts about money and investing. If you have questions about the show or want to find out more about BRI, send an email to jefft at lasallest.com. Remember, this journey is all about putting wisdom over worth, principles over profit, morals over money, and integrity over it all. God bless.